Hello and welcome to another episode of Virtual Legality. I'm your host, Richard Hogue, managing member of the Hogue Law Business Law Firm of Northville, Michigan. And today we're going to talk about the big investment that everybody is talking about, Sony's investment of $250 million into our favorite free-to-play video game provider, Epic Games. And if you haven't followed this story, a lot of news articles have been written about it. Some good, some bad. We're not going to go over those mostly, except to say that the reason we're doing this video is a number of people came to me and asked whether or not this meant that the Unreal Engine or Fortnite or anything else related to Epic Games would not be coming to Xbox or would somehow be limited on PC in some tangible fashion. And what we are going to go over is exactly the reasons why that won't be the case. Now, if you haven't been to virtual legality before, then you haven't heard that I'm a corporate lawyer. I'm not one of those lawyers that's on law and order. I'm not getting up there and standing and saying objection and talking to judges and having sidebars. I do contracts and I do investments. And one of the things that I have done in my career pretty extensively is work with large corporations that want to finance their research and development through what we call strategic investments. Uh, a lot of that on my side has been through venture capital funds. Uh, funds that go specifically to high-risk, very small businesses. And that, of course, isn't Epic Games. But the concept here is similar. So let's take a look at the headline. This is the actual press release, The Wire, that Epic and Sony jointly released. And it's called, Epic Games Receives Strategic Investment from Sony Corporation. Now keep your eye on that strategic word because that's important to what is happening here. Sony Corporation and Epic Games Incorporated are pleased to announce that Sony has agreed to make a strategic investment of $250 million to acquire a minority interest in Epic through a wholly owned subsidiary of Sony. You can see a couple of different highlights that I have made there, and those reflect a couple of different areas that I want to talk about. The very first is the notion of a strategic investment. Now, if you haven't invested in a company or haven't gone through and discussed these kinds of things before, there are two basic types of investment, and I know I am short tailing this entire conversation for you investment bankers that are watching this video. But a strategic investment is distinct from a financial investment. A financial investment is exactly what you think it is. You put $100 in somewhere on the hopes that it becomes $150 later. You maybe believe in the business, you've talked to the founders, whatever it might be, but it otherwise is just like investing in the stock market at a public company or buying bonds or whatever it might be. You're just trying to get your money to grow specifically through investing in the efforts of another. A strategic investment is different. A strategic investment says, hmm, there is something about this business that synergizes or otherwise relates to the business that I otherwise conduct. And so I want to invest in this company for other reasons. So specifically calling it out as a as a strategic investment, hangs a lampshade on what we know. Epic Games and Sony are involved in some of the similar types of markets, particularly with Sony and their PlayStation 5 and selling video games. Another way of looking at it is as an investment that drives your primary business. I've pulled up an answer here from Quora, which is not a website I recommend using too often on legal and business questions, but I really like this answer. And this was based around the question of what is a strategic investment? And they say, at Citibank, we defined it as an investment that drives a primary business. The theory is that strategic investment is great because it is clearly in your domain. And if the business changes, you can be at the forefront of the change and enjoy a return on the investment at the same time. Also, it should be a great path to acquisition should that become the obvious next step. The reality is that strategic investment is tough, though, because you are bound by the conflict of investing in areas that are likely competitive with your current business instead of just being driven by your internal rate of return, like a venture capital firm would be as a more financial investor. So there's a couple of things to piece out here. But one is that your goal here is to Hedge your bets if you think the business is going to move in a different direction and you think they're being very successful with whatever your investing party is going to do and to otherwise ride that train and potentially get access to technology and information and expertise, which is, I think, both things that are happening here, right? Sony sees the writing on the wall, sees Fortnite, sees what Epic is doing as something new and different. We're going to talk about why that is, in fact, the case as we go on with this video. But they also want to say, okay, we want to be in the business of talking with Epic regularly because Epic has this 
insight has this foothold on a portion of the market that maybe we don't, maybe we could get better at. And yes, Unreal Engine's a part of that, but I think the biggest part of it is Fortnite, the metaverse advertising, as we will see. Another kind of reference to it is, in addition to receiving much needed capital resources, the smaller business, and we're gonna talk about the size of Epic, but it is in fact the smaller business compared to the size of Sony. Both huge, gigantic corporations. So a lot of what you see here, if you go into this space and you just look up strategic investment on Google or wherever, is you will see what I was talking about in my line of work, which is big companies investing in smaller companies, venture capital investments, to effectively outsource their R&D and to sign a commercial contract to go and do specific research and development along with that investment. And that is, in fact, what I did for a large portion of my career. In addition to ROI, that's your return on investment, the investor receives a licensing agreement, a marketing partnership, a distribution arrangement, or some other collaborative benefit, sometimes more ephemeral, sometimes more contractual. The point is you get something else out of it. And they give an example, which I liked here, which is that Rent.com got a bunch of money from real estate investment trusts. And these relationships provided Rent.com with capital, the money, But more importantly, they gave them an immediate source of listings when they moved into new local markets. It was a strategic advantage for both the real estate investment trusts and rent.com. And that's what you see when this thing is really working. Unfortunately, a lot of big companies invest strategically in companies that are maybe adjacent to what they're doing. Maybe they don't have a great feel for exactly what it is the smaller company should be doing. The technology is ephemeral or new or just plain old doesn't work. And so a lot of this kind of mirrors at this really small company level, the kind of risks that you associate with venture capital. Continuing on with this statement though, $250 million is not a small amount of money, right? But it acquired a minority interest in Epic through a wholly owned subsidiary of Sony. Now that might be a wholly owned subsidiary that is specifically formed for the purpose of investing in Epic. And the reason you would do that is to isolate your liabilities and your contractual relationships down the line and not to Sony proper or to somewhere else. Or it might be an existing investment entity that Sony uses to invest in these kinds of things. We don't know. It's not actually that important, but I did note it because it's an interesting piece of the puzzle that they actually put in their press release. The more important part is $250 million, which you might anticipate buys a large portion of Epic. And it would have eight years ago. Tencent, famously, Chinese company, bought, I believe it's a 40% share of Epic for $330 million seven or eight years ago. But $250 million doesn't buy you what it bought you at Epic as of then. Instead, as we see here from a tweet from Daniel Ahmad at ZHugeEX, Quick thread on Sony and Epic deals. Sony made a strategic investment of $250 million in Epic to acquire a 1.4% minority stake. The investment cements an already close relationship is to explore opportunities for further collaboration, primarily around entertainment. We're going to have more to say on that. But you might be asking yourself, how does Daniel Ahmad here, who doesn't necessarily have any extra access to the informational documents from Sony or Epic, arrive at this number just from the press release? And the answer is because we had leaks about what Epic was going out there and raising money off of. You see here a headline, Epic Games' valuation around $17 billion after $750 million funding round. So they say after, they're not being terribly clear about what their number is here. But when you are offering your stock, and you don't have to go through a stock market necessarily, and you're offering it as a private corporation, you set a price. You say, okay... I think my company, before you put any money in, is worth $17 billion. And so once you have that number in place, you can do the backwards math and come up with what X amount of dollars should buy as a portion of the company. Or if we're looking at this from the Sony side of things, you've got a $17 billion, what we call a pre-money valuation. This is what the company looks like before any money comes in. A $17.75 billion post-money valuation that includes the $750 million that is going to come in. That's the size of their offering. And then you can do the math and see, okay, if you invest $250 million at a $17 billion pre-money valuation, you come up with 1.4%, which is nothing. 
right? There is no ability to control the operations of the company. And we're going to talk about what rights, if any, they would have associated with this. They will be invested in a series of stock that's going to come with certain voting and other rights associated with it, but probably not direction of the company, probably not a seat on the board of directors. And to be honest, that's probably just fine with Sony. I also note here at the bottom of this little calculation, that means that 98.6% of the company is owned by figures other than Sony. As we talked about Tencent, the original founders of Epic, all of those folks have an interest in the operations of the company. And that does put a limit on what a Sony can do. So when people come to me and ask the question, does this mean that Unreal Engine won't be on Xbox or it won't be available on PC or in the same way, or that Sony will be able to avoid certain amounts of money in respect of the Epic Game Store? The answer is it could mean some of those things, but not because Sony invested in the company. Sony investing in the company doesn't lead to that kind of exclusivity, doesn't lead to changes in the way that Epic operates because of a minority investment, less than 2%, and because of various aspects of the law. Now, if you have been in virtual legality before, you heard us talk about fiduciary duty, right? And that is the notion that the corporation has to run as if it is holding everybody else's money, all of its shareholders' money, for the benefit of those shareholders. And it can't just use this pile of money that it has access to for anything else. So it can't take that 98.6% of the money that it has and somehow benefit Sony in a way that doesn't help the company overall. And if you want to see that highlighted, one of the things that you can do is you can go and you can look at the statutes that govern the way these corporations are to operate. Now, I went and did this. The very first place I started was North Carolina, because if you look at the bottom of the press release, or if you're familiar with Epic Games at all, you know they operate in North Carolina. That means that they have to have at least a certificate of authority to conduct their business operations in that state. You can go and you can look up any state that you want where you know that one of these places is headquartered. And if you look up Epic Games, you see, oh, their citizenship is foreign. Now, foreign in this context means something different than you might be thinking. It doesn't mean that they're international. It means that they are not from this state. And in fact, you can see the state of incorporation is Maryland, which I have to be honest with you, I have never looked up an entity that has been organized in Maryland. Almost every really large company in the United States is organized in the state of Delaware, really by accident of history. And then once you have a kind of critical mass in a specific state like Delaware, Investors don't like surprises, so they like to invest in only corporations domiciled in that state so that they understand what the rules and the laws and what the likely court cases are going to be in that state. Epic doesn't have that problem because they aren't on a stock exchange. They don't necessarily need to attract this new money, and they obviously haven't had a problem attracting money, as you can see, from this $250 million raise. But it does mean you can track them over to Maryland. And you can look up their Maryland filing history. You can see, yep, they formed in Maryland. They are named Epic Games, Inc. And then we can start to understand exactly what duties their corporate board is looking at. So we pull up their section 2-405.1, the standard of care required of directors. And it says, in general, a director of a corporation shall act in good faith in a manner the director reasonably believes to be in the best interest of the corporation. That's the big one. And with the care that an ordinarily prudent person in a like position would use under similar circumstances. So number two here is generally referred to as the duty of loyalty. Number three here is generally referred to as the duty of care. But number two is what's important. Whatever a director or at the corporate level looks at and believes to be in the best interest of the corporation is what they have to do. So Sony can't come in here and say, you are going to cut off unreal sales to everything on the Xbox because that's not going to make sense for Epic maximizing its money. Now, if they could come up with some really crazy contract that otherwise paid Epic billions in order to not go on to the Xbox, then they of course could, but they could do that without first investing $250 million. And the $250 million doesn't change that characterization. Similarly, Interested board member transactions are void or voidable in Maryland, as in the rest of the states of the union, to be honest, if you don't go through certain processes to get them cleansed. 
right? It says, if subsection B of this section is complied with, a contract or other transaction between a corporation and any of its directors or between a corporation and any other corporation, firm, or other entity in which any of its directors is a director or has a a material financial interest is not void or voidable, of course, implying that it is void or voidable if you don't meet these things, solely because of a common directorship or interest, the presence of the director at the meeting of the board or a committee, or the counting of the vote of that director. But you have to comply with subsection B, which says if you disclose the common directorship of interest and it's approved by the directors that aren't the interested director or the rest of the stockholders of the corporation, it's fine. Or if the contract or transaction is fair and reasonable to the corporation. So you might say, Rick, well, you can comply with subsection B just by being fair and reasonable. And then you don't have to worry about any of this interested party transaction issues. And that's absolutely true. But if this isn't your first rodeo in virtual legality, you know that this kind of language, the contract is fair and reasonable, is an enormous neon sign lit doorway into litigation, right? Because if you don't go get it cleansed by the board or the stockholders, and you rely only on two here, you only need one stockholder to sue on behalf of the corporation and to say, judge, this contract wasn't fair. And that probably gets you past summary judgment. And that probably gets you into discovery and then fighting about what fair means. And that's a very expensive litigation, especially with hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars on the line. So one of the things that we see happen here is when you're investing, you get 1.4%. You don't necessarily want to be on the board. You say, Rick, you said they would have access to all this information. Doesn't that require them to be on the board? The answer is no. In general, venture capital, which this is not, but it is similar in kind of type. In general, venture capital often chooses to be what we call a board observer versus a board member. And this particular board observer describes the role as follows. As an observer, I am an active participant in board meetings. I get to sit in the room. I get the Panera order. It's all great but I don't vote on any board matters. And in some cases I need to step out of meetings typically to protect attorney client privilege, which covers those board members, but not board observers. So when you're investing in a company strategically, and as I said, I did this a lot, you have what we call a side letter or a management rights letter. And it often says, I'm gonna get to be a board observer. You're gonna share all of the information that you otherwise share with the board with me. I'm gonna get to sit in on meetings. I'm gonna get all the notices that relate to being a board member. I just don't get a vote. And if something like attorney-client privilege pops up, or most specifically, if a conflict of interest pops up, if the board is going to be discussing how they're gonna burn the Sony Corporation, then I'm asked to leave the room, right? And so that can potentially go on the agenda. Maybe you hide it a little bit and you say, okay, now board observer, you need to leave. But those are the two areas in which that happens most often. But otherwise, if I'm Sony, I get a person that sits in that room, that gets to participate in those conversations, that gets to meet with the big wigs at Epic and Tencent and every other investor that Epic has to continue those relationships, to hopefully strategically ally, and all for the low, low price of $250 million. Now, why is Sony really so interested in Epic? I think a lot of it comes out in the rest of the statement. The investment allows Sony and Epic to aim to broaden their collaboration across Sony's leading portfolio of entertainment assets and technology and Epic's social entertainment platform and digital ecosystem to create unique experiences for consumers and creators. Now that was vetted by public relations and probably legal, right? Because half of those words, even though we can recognize them as English, don't make sense on their own. That being said, what we can start to tease out of this are the references to Fortnite. Epic's social entertainment platform. That's Fortnite. Digital ecosystem, a little bit more unclear. Epic Game Store. You're thinking that Sony's going to have some kind of extra relationship with the Epic Game Store, which is again an important entry point for them because if they want to participate in that store, it's a curated environment and you want to have those relationships. And what says relationship more than a $250 million hello present? 
Now, the closing of the investment is subject to customary closing conditions, including regulatory approvals. That's probably not that big of a deal, but it does mean, as we've talked about in previous episodes of this series, that it's not done yet. Sony hasn't sent the wire for $250 million. They have to pass certain approvals and do other things, sign up other documents. It'll probably happen. These don't generally get wiped after you have a press release like this, but it's worth noting it hasn't happened as of today. Now you get the quotes. Epic's powerful technology in areas such as graphics places them at the forefront of game engine development with Unreal Engine and other innovations. That's your compliment, right? That's getting the other side warmed up. You know what? Your Unreal Engine is spectacular. Love it. It's beautiful. There's no better example of this than the revolutionary entertainment experience Fortnite. Really? Now that is a non sequitur. Epic is undoubtedly great at graphics. Unreal Engine is fantastic. The Unreal Engine 5 demo is wonderful. It's beautiful. Very cool to look at. There's no better example of this than Fortnite doesn't really follow from the first sentence, right? And when you see something like this, when you see an absolute non sequitur in the quotes, and this quote, yes, was undoubtedly approved by the specific individual that gives his name to the quote, was still drafted by public relations. And you look at this and you say, okay, They want to get Fortnite in here. They don't just want to talk about Unreal. That's the obvious thing. That's what Epic is really known for before they made their billions of dollars in Fortnite. But we want to talk about Fortnite. And what our guys came up with was, you've got great graphics and there's no better example of this than Fortnite. That doesn't make any sense for anybody that's a gamer and knows that Fortnite, while attractive, is not showing off any specific, highly detailed graphical environment. Through our investment... We will explore opportunities for further collaboration with Epic. And we saw this in the previous reference, but it's worth noting, they continue to classify their existing relationship as collaborative, right? So when we're thinking about what's going to happen here, we shouldn't be thinking of it as quantitatively different necessarily, not a sea change to their relationship. They view it as further collaboration. They're trying to cement their relationship. This is a corporation buying another corporation, a bundle of roses and saying, I really like you. And that's what's happening. We want to further collaborate to delight and bring value to consumers and the industry at large, not only in games, that's a big one, but also across the rapidly evolving digital entertainment landscape, said Kenichiro Yoshida, chairman, president, and CEO, Sony Corporation. Note here, by the way, it's Sony Corp. It is not anything specific. It's not Sony Interactive Entertainment. It's not aimed specifically at PlayStation. And I think that's very, very important. Now, the Epic quote, Sony and Epic have both built businesses at the intersection of creativity and technology. And we share a vision of real-time 3D social experiences leading to a convergence of gaming, film, and music. Fortnite, Fortnite, Fortnite. Together, we strive to build an even more open and accessible digital ecosystem for all consumers and content creators alike. So... We've got the intersection of creativity and technology. We've got Sony saying not only in games. They deliberately call out Fortnite in their quote. So what is happening here? I think one of the things that is happening here and the driver of this conversation is not just Unreal Engine, which you did see perform on the PlayStation 5. You saw Tim Sweeney say a lot of nice things about it. You saw some tweets if you are on social media from him where he denies making those statements specifically to get Sony to invest or having any relationship with Sony prior to making those statements. All well and good. The actual discussion here is about Fortnite. I did an episode a little while back. I think it is my least viewed episode of virtual legality in the past month or two. You folks don't like it when I put Fortnite in the title, which is pretty funny. But I called it the future is Fortnite, and it was all about this metaverse concept. And metaverse is a fancy way of talking about being in an area and socially interacting. And I talk about it a lot in that video if you are interested. But more importantly than just the highfalutin concept of a metaverse, Fortnite is quickly becoming an advertising platform that everybody wants to be involved in. Fortnite virtual rap concert draws record 12.3 million attendees. The attendance surpassed the prior record of 10.7 million for a virtual show featuring DJ and music producer Marshmallow last year. Scott's 15-minute performance hit a record for its premiere on Thursday. Fortnite followed Scott's astronomical concert with a repeat on Friday, three more on Saturday for fans in other time zones per variety. 
And this is what you are looking at if you are looking at things from Sony's perspective. We want to have the relationship with Epic, not just for games, specifically in their quote. And what does Sony sell? Sony sells movies. Sony sells television. Sony sells music. And then, yes, Sony sells games. But it's only a part of their overall platform. And Sony is exactly the kind of company that has all of these assets that they are trying to market in 2020 and beyond. And they are seeing the stats come out from places like Fortnite. And they are seeing them say that 40% of some odd kids in the kids demographic are playing Fortnite. And some for huge amounts of time. And Fortnite is starting to sell The Rise of Skywalker and various Christopher Nolan movies in their space. They vision Fortnite as something different. And now a lot of these big corporations are starting to sign on. So when we talk about strategic investments, when we talk about something like this, if you are limiting your thought process here to the console war, you are not thinking like Sony is thinking. Sony maybe wants to have a relationship with Epic that strengthens their video game output through just good relationships about Unreal, maybe getting slightly better tech support, that kind of thing. But they are not going to isolate Epic from selling Unreal Engine to work on the Xbox or the Nintendo or anywhere else, frankly, because Epic and Maryland law prevents them from doing that without a real good reason. It has to be a fair and reasonable contract or otherwise blessed by the other shareholders who aren't going to bless just giving money away to Sony for no reason. And since they can't do that, Sony isn't giving Epic $250 million solely to just say hi. They want to have a closer relationship. They want Fortnite to pick Sony Pictures movies more often. They want Fortnite to be involved with the marketing of everything that they have to market. And they have their toes in every bit of pop culture, whether or not you like Sony Pictures output or Sony Music output or how Sony treats people through the DMCA on YouTube. The fact remains they are huge in the pop culture landscape and they see Fortnite and Epic as an entry point into a brand new marketing model and $250 million, a drop in the bucket for getting to participate in that model on a far more localized basis. And again, there's a lot of speculation here, especially in the middle of this video, about what they would get out of their investment, but it would surprise me if they didn't get a board observation, right? It would surprise me if they didn't get access to financial information of certain stripes and access to reports from the company that help them understand what Epic is doing, what they are seeing, potentially access to analytics that Fortnite is receiving from its users and things along those lines. Those are the kind of collaborative strategic reasons to give another company a quarter of a billion dollars. And so this isn't solely a console war kind of discussion. This isn't solely related to video games. This is related to the future of advertising and marketing. And I tend to agree that Epic is visioned in the right direction, that they are looking at things correctly, that Fortnite does have this foothold on what is going to be a sea change in the way we market virtually every product, but specifically art and leisure products to a brand new demographic that is up and coming and is going to be the wealthy demographic before we can blink our eyes. That's been Virtual Legality for today. If you enjoyed this, please like, subscribe, ring bells, tell people that we are here. We talk about the business and law of pop culture, music, movies, video games, and we love having conversations with new people here in the comments to these videos. So please do tell folks that we are here. Otherwise, if you saw this on YouTube, thank you so much for watching. And if you listen to it as a podcast, thank you so much for listening. And I will catch you on the very next episode of Virtual Legality. Virtual Legality is a YouTube video series with audio podcast versions presented as commentary and for education and entertainment purposes only. It does not constitute legal advice and does not create an attorney-client relationship. If you have legal questions about the topics discussed, please consult your own legal counsel.